right, colleagues, welcome, warm welcome to you. Thank you for staying with us into the afternoon. I hope you got a little coffee or something to give you a little boost for this. I know there's sometimes an afternoon slump, but I promise you this is going to be an interesting session. So we're here to talk about youth work in small island states. And I'm pleased to be joined here and to introduce Shanice Webb, who is from the Association of Youth Development Professionals of Trinidad and Tobago. And she's also going to be joined um, by Jasmine Thomas, the director of the Department of Youth Affairs in the Turks and Caicos Islands. She's going to be joining us virtually shortly. <clears throat> but we have a treat here because we're going to hear about uh, from the Turks and Caicos Islands about a process of revitalizing um, youth work in that country, those twin island states and another twin island <laughs> state. Uh, Shanice is going to talk to us about contextualizing youth development work in the Caribbean with special reference to Trinidad and to Britain. So I, for one, am very excited to hear about this. I, I hail from the Caribbean, so I'm very familiar with small island states, but I'm very excited to hear about what they want, they have to share with us. So I'm going to hand over to you, Shanice. The floor is yours. Thank you, Diane. Um, What's better than one island, two islands? So um, I'm from Trinidad and Tobago, and I really want to talk about the process of us um, getting the association started in that process. Um, we're still in. Um, we are currently at the stage of um, making sure that we have our registration and stuff completed. We already submitted all our documents to the local ministry and also in terms of having our constitutions and stuff formalized and really um, we have an established steering committee and we're reaching out to other young people to join the process, right? So it would be remiss of me not to talk about Dr. Charles. And I don't know, this is the next time. Sorry. Um, and if you didn't know by now, you know who he is. Right, um, he has been a lot of things, a lot of people, and um, his work speaks for itself. He has advocated for young people in the region, um, both, um, I guess for me, it's both individually, but also systematically, right? He has spoken on behalf of me and my colleagues in rooms that we would never be able to access, right? And as someone, as a former president of the Trinidad Youth Council, um, he has always looked out for me and my colleagues, um, but also in terms of policy, he has also been one that has been in the forefront of developing our national youth policy in Trinidad and Tobago. And one of the things that he was able to, and I think is a really win, a win for us, especially as a professional association, is him including the aspect of professionalizing youth, youth work in the youth policy. So that is one of the pillars in the policy, that's pillar eight, right? And that pillar speaks about promoting a culture of professional professionalism within youth work, taking action to facilitate the professionalization of youth development work, enhancing youth development knowledge base, promoting opportunities for youth development practitioners and academics to share their research on youth development in Trinidad and Tobago, thereby contributing to the enhancement of practice of youth development practice establishing a national youth development institute to facilitate professional development of youth development practitioners, facilitate the participation of youth development practitioners at appropriate multi-sectoral regional youth workshops, conferences, exchanges, seminars to foster culture of positive youth development and youth mainstreaming, support the establishment of a national youth workers association, Accelerated development and implementation of national youth work occupational standards, youth work competence standards, and codes of ethics for youth development work practitioners, and establishing a system of 
a system of recognition to celebrate the accomplishments and excellence in service of youth development practitioners. So that is something that's in the policy that wasn't there in the previous policies before. And really that allows us as an association to really stand on something for us to be able to advocate and lobby government and say, hey, y'all said this. Hey, y'all included this. And this is how we are going to see this through and also be able to have access to further resources. Next. Um, so this is the team, right? It's made up of Anoka Sonata. He is the director for gender, the office of the prime minister in Trinidad and Tobago. Uh, Victoria Rampasad and Richie Bansraj, they are both youth officers at the Ministry of um, youth Development and National Service. And that in itself is also a win for young people because youth development has always been volleyed around in different ministries. We've never had a standalone ministry for that. It has been with child development, it's been with gender, and yeah, so it's been with gender, it's been with sports, but never seen as something that had its own focus. Um, and I think that is so important. And um, so we've been working over um, at least a year, really um, formulating the um, the establishment of the AYDP in Trinidad and Tobago. But before that process, before we even got here, there um, is a host of other things that happened, right? So I'll just be able to share that story with you all. Next. Um, and the journey to the AYDP really started during the pandemic. Right. And in the pandemic, um, when we thought that we were only going to be on two week lockdown, um, as the president of the Youth Council at the time, we held a virtual youth summit, right? And during on that summit, we were able to cover topics such as entrepreneurship, time management, health and wellness, COVID-19, the impact of youth, education and employment. Right, and we were able to have over a thousand young people join us virtually. And this is the beginning of the pandemic, it's like April 2020, right? And so we had young people from across the English speaking Caribbean as well as young people from Africa because of our connection to the ACP, the Africa Caribbean Pacific. Um, there's a young professionals group in the UK, um, Yento. Yeah, we probably all know Yentel. Um, so because of her, um, the, her connection, she was able to share our sessions with them and they were a part of it. And it was really some dynamic sessions and some very important work. And because of that, uh, we were later able to do some other things. So, um, so just to speak on some of the issues that young people face during the pandemic, Right during the COVID nineteen pandemic, young people in Trinidad and Tobago and the wider Caribbean faced several key issues. One being educational disruption, and you know I'm sure some of these issues are similar across um, the world and across different regions. Right, um, so we saw the closure of in um, schools, and because of you know, some, some countries may have had that familiarity with online modalities, but it wasn't something that we were familiar with, especially in the public school system. So we saw the creation of that digital divide with young people, um, even teachers not being properly trained, um, the lack of, um, we had where teachers were printing out hard copies, leaving it at schools for parents to collect. So the children had to have workbooks, right? Teachers were doing that with their own money to be able to help their children get further along. Because we knew that if it is that some of them wouldn't catch up, there wouldn't be a space and time for them to get um, back to where they needed to be, especially those who were closer to um, exams to enter into secondary school and also for their, I guess, our CXC to do the upper levels, A-level um, courses. Right. We also saw mental health challenges, especially because of the different social distancing um, policies being put in place. Right. There was an increased stress on young people. Right. And also because of the challenges that persons face due to employment and economic 
um, impacts, right? The pandemic's economic repercussions have disproportionately affected young individuals, particularly in sectors of tourism, hospitality, and retail, right? As a, a Caribbean island, tourism is such a huge part of our GDP, especially um, not so much in Trinidad, but in Tobago. So we saw a lot of young people, you know, really having nothing to really do. Um, one with their time, but also in terms of being able to earn an income. And one of the issues that we also faced was because some people were, I would, um, I guess, informally employed in a way, where they're not necessarily part of the national insurance service, they're not paying their tax, their insurance, national insurance, their employers are not paying that for them, they weren't able to access um, the grants and um, things like that that were available right because of that so also young people face social isolation and loneliness and limited access to health care and social and reproductive health services the pandemic has disrupted young people's access to essential health care services including srhr resources reducing access to contraceptive sexual education and other reproductive health services have created barriers to safe and informed decision making this situation heightened the risk of unintended pregnancies, increasing the vulnerability of sexual transmitted infection, and impairs the overall well-being and reproductive rights of young individuals. Right? So we are faced with all these challenges, and we realize, okay, COVID is going to be around for a long time. And then we saw our government implement what we call the roadmap to recovery, right? And so in April of 20, April 16, 2020, in response to the COVID-19 pandemic health crisis, our Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Rowley, established a committee responsible for the development of a roadmap to recovery for Trinidad and Tobago, which would guide national social economic planning. At first, the committee was constituted of 22 members with business leaders and academic, public servants, and other civic representatives. Right, so there was an outcry because of all those people, no one represented youths. There was no gender balance, and it really didn't necessarily represent the population in that way. You know, there were older people, business people, but not necessarily um, all voices being represented in that grouping. So as a result of that, we were able as young people to come together to create what was called the Youth COVID Response Initiative. Right, so that contain 14 young people, all right, about 50% men, 50% women, making sure that we had a gender balance, socioeconomic balance, and even factoring the ethnicity and all of that into the people that comprise that grouping. And from that, we were able to create recommendations that would then go towards the Roma to Recovery team, right? Our recommendations included being able to build remote work capabilities for SMEs, establishing Spanish as a second official language for Trinidad and Tobago, creating grants for artists that are tied to creative and innovative innovation projects, such as production of live concert, TV, right? All those things that were going on through the quarantine period, we wanted to be able to have access for young people to resources, right? Enhancing Wi-Fi accessibility with a special focus on rural areas and marginalized communities, as well as strict enforcement of NIS payments for business registration to ensure that the event that stay-at-home policies employees are able to access government assistance. We also create, wanted the creation of a uh, research and development environment for value-added products and services in agriculture, enhancing research and the extension of services, right? So this team really can included young people from different sectors, not just youth practitioners, but also um, subject matter experts in different areas, such as employment and volunteering, education, business entrepreneurship, tourism, arts and culture, right? So this is just some of the impact of the COVID-19. Next one. Right. So in terms of the goal of the YCRI, our goal was to create or submit recommendations to the committee and also to advocate for young people, for youth mainstream and frameworks that are inclusive of youth as meaningful partners in policy making, planning, and development.
Till next week. So I just want to touch on the impact of what we were able to achieve um, based on that process. So one, we were able to publish a report and that report was then circulated within the committee, right? And also we were able to uh, participate in the UNESCO Knowledge Series, right? That's focused on inclusive and equitable recovery from COVID-19 in Caribbean small island developing states. We were also featured in different various radio programs. And also we participated in a dialogue series called Youthful Exuber Exuberance, Reengaging Youth in Inclusive Recovery. So this was with UNESCO and also the University of the West Indies. Um, also, we were able to participate with um, the Global Student Summit um, with their Vaccine Justice, um, with the summit is called Vaccine Justice, Fairness, Trust and responsibility. Also, that then led into us figuring out, OK, we've been able to um, do this work with the YCRI, but how do we become more formalized? How do we really address the issues of young people in a more sustainable and realistic way? And that is where the genesis of the association right, was started. So our goal is to promote the youth mainstreaming in all government and society to support professionalization of youth work nationally and strengthen rights-based frameworks for the initiatives, the youth initiatives, right? So we really want to emphasize the importance of providing autonomous political spaces, expression and community for young people based on their own terms, right? So even though that we weren't included in that specific process, we as young people didn't necessarily take that line down. We wanted to say, hey, y'all didn't include us, but we can still make a contribution. We can also still let our voices be heard in the work that we're doing. So that is what um, we chose to do, right? To ensure the protection of these rights and institutions, Right, the institutions that aim to establish a national body that guarantees youth political rights and decision making power. The COVID 19 pandemic has revealed the limitations of state responses in safeguarding the rights and well being of Caribbean youth. Despite efforts to address social and educational needs of young people, their political agency and ability to contribute to fiscal, fiscal and policy decisions have been insufficiently considered. In response to this context, a coalition of youth leaders and youth workers from both government and not governmental sector has formed a steering committee for a national youth workers association. Right. Next. So this is our SWOT analysis, really kind of looking at the landscape and really um, trying to identify what we have that exists in terms of strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Right, so in terms of our, stre our strengths, um, we see that the adoption of um, the having the Ministry for Youth Development and National Service is a strength. Um, we also have a highly educated um, cadre of youth workers, right? Um, also in terms of weaknesses, so there are limitations in terms of the implementation of youth mainstream frameworks and safeguarding protocols for young people. Also, limited participation of youth workers in non-social sectors of development, right? So most of the projects that youth workers would engage in would be um, like community-based social projects, but not necessarily take it into economic and political issues of young people as well, right? So the absence of accountability mechanisms of state and non-state actors to monitor impact of policy outcomes for youth. So we do have this policy, but there's nothing set up right now to make sure, okay, we are on that trajectory to accomplish what's in the policy. We know, okay, this is where we are, this is where we're going, and how far along we are. We don't necessarily have those things. I know Mr. Charles would have been working with the ministry to establish some of those things. Um, and so we're not sure where we are now, 
right? Um, even he was also working on establishing the National Youth Council. So in Trinidad, we have a Trinidad Youth Council, we have a Tobago Youth Council, but there have always been that desire to create a National Youth Council. Um, we've seen, uh, during my time at the council, we've seen different, um, what I say, attempts to get that done. Um, none have been successful thus far. And I think part of it is because it has been driven by the ministry, right? Um, as, as a youth practitioner, um, we feel a sense of hope. We felt a sense of hope knowing that Mr. Charles was a part of the process, right? That we would get a fair shake, or at least he would try to. Um, but in the absence of him, there's a vacuum of like what happens now with those things um so so our hope is that um that young people continue to be a part of the process right that young people are more meaningfully engaged um and i know in terms of my experience of the work that mr charles has done that is what he has always done he has always involved young people in terms of the consultation process um, from the youth policy. I don't know a young person who involved the youth that wasn't consulted. <laughs> I don't know a young person. If you wasn't, because I don't know. I don't know them. Everyone was consulted. There were multiple consultations. There were one-on-one -on -one interviews. They were, they would court, there was Zoom. They would come to you to do the, it, it's a, they would find you. <laughs> to do these consultations. Young people have been consulted by Mr. Charles and his team, right? And that's the important part. There is a team, there's a cadre of other young people that he always brought in. Uh, Penelope Mongru, Kimberly Gilbert, um, Amilka, all these people were brought in, Tioka, all these people were brought in by him. And that's the important part of the message of who he was, that it wasn't just individual. You know, as much as he could, he brought in other young people so that they could participate in the process, that they could bring value, and also that they could learn, you know? And I think he, and I think that is why we are so, I guess, emotional, is that he was a mentor to all of us. Um, so in terms of opportunities, um, we are a member of Kiowa, and that's a huge opportunity for us um, to um, have that um, partnership to be able to get the process going and have that support um, at a Commonwealth level, right? Also, there's opportunities for us to partner with um, educational institutions to promote um, programs toward the professionalization of youth work. Um, so when it comes to threats, uh, one of the threats that we have when it comes to youth work is the politicization of youth workers and youth institutions. Um, and that's the thing, when the government is the process, they control the process, right? And sometimes um, youth institutions is used or seen as political footballs and political tools. And what would tend to happen, because we have a two-party system, right? So if one party does something, when the other party comes in, they throw away the baby with the bathwater, right? And we don't want that to happen to our institutions. We don't want um, organizations to go dormant because of it being stifled, because of a lack of resources and you know inability to be sustainable, right? So we want to make sure that, um, the young leaders who are part of it are nonpartisan, right? We can all have our own political beliefs, but the institution needs to be set apart and held to a higher standard, right? Um, and in terms of sustainable financing, that is also a challenge for us. Um, and especially too, where youth workers are either working for the government or volunteer right so there are a lack of opportunities for persons to really see youth work as a profession in that way that they could earn a, a, a proper livelihood with it learn a living wage and be able to build a sustainable um life right so that is really a threat because we then lose a lot of our great talent we do have that brain drain where people go to other um other institutions or go into the um, business realm because you know everybody wants to have the dream you know the white the powers and picket fence we don't have any Caribbean but, but you know 
that version of it. Um, so, so really that's something we need to be able to look at is how do we make youth work as something that is sustainable um, financially and, you know, benefits all. And even when it comes to the government, um, we have an issue where the youth workers are also not necessarily stable, right? Because they now have short-term contracts, three months, one month. You know, that's not, a, a, you know, when it comes to a profession, how could you really plan your life on something like that? So that is really um, the crux of the challenge that we face. And so in conclusion, what we aim is to create an institution that is strong and sustainable where young people cannot be denied, right? We have sought to liberate the concept of the Youth Workers Association as a narrow career development professional workers group and center the institution as an institution for youth political power and agency. Membership and leadership of the Youth Workers Association is not just youth, but have a political commitment to young people's empowerment and desire for self-determination, right? And as I said, we integrate an institution that is strong and sustainable where young people cannot be denied. And my last slide is a quote from Dr. Charles, where he says, fundamentally, youth empowerment is not about the ability of young people, it's about the ability of young people, irrespective of their socioeconomic status, ethnicity, gender, physical and mental capacity, geographic location, religious or political affiliation to actively promote and legally defend their individual and collective interests. Thank you. Thank you so much. Really, really nice to hear about that story, the genesis. We're going to come back to some of the, the questions we have around um, that evolution, but it's great to see that development in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, we now want to hear what it looks like um, in terms of the evolution of youth work in the Turks and Caicos Islands, and to hear more about that process of what's called revitalization of youth work in Turks and Caicos. We're going to have, we hope, no, not unfortunately not we don't. Yet. Okay, um, hopefully she might join if she gets the chance. Sadly, we're having technical difficulties, but it would have been nice to have that comparison, but we are all here. So it means that we have more time to chat and to dig into this. So let me at this point open the floor for any questions. For those who are joining us online, if there's anybody uh, with a burning question, uh, please go to slido.com. You're going to enter the code 859-2492. That's 859-2492 in your browser, and you're going to click on room 103. I think it has a little green icon and you'll be able to post your questions there so that we can field them uh, to our panelists. Um, but to those in the room, any questions? If you don't come in, I'm gonna take moderator's privilege and take up all the time. Okay, I see two questions. I see two hands here, Gavin and then. Um, I was particularly interested in the engagement approach um, during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'd, I'd like to find out how, how, how you went about the auditing and the entering of the young persons at the, at the, the rural, especially, I'm, I'm going to ask about rural youth and mm. how you got them and, and tell me about that part. Right. Those so what we just, we looked at, um, we had different Team, thematic areas, yeah. right? So we had two people that were assigned to each thematic area, and those persons would then reach out within their networks to acquire those responses, right? So we persons chose to do like phone calls. We also had a, a survey, mm -hmm. a Google survey that persons also did to be able to reach out to young people in the different areas as well. Sorry, second question. Hi, morning. I'm Charlie from Grenada, Geneva. Um, under, under the weakness, you mentioned political, something about politics. Mm -hmm. Right. I, I kind of wanted to know how that has been for us. I'll probably I'll give us as an example. In Grenada, the, 
we, start, we started establishing the National Youth Work Association. Um, when I used to be in the Ministry of Youth, I was charged with the responsibility as the focal point um, to carry that through by the then Minister of Youth and with the support of the, the Commonwealth, etc. We got an in-kind, small in-kind grant to facilitate the consultations and all the process. And we probably got really far off. And then the minister changed and a new minister came on and we completed up to the constitution and the bylaws and the code of ethics and that had to go of course to the to the um because the the, the grant from commonwealth came to the ministry mm -hmm. it now means the ministry had to go through the bureaucratic process of sending it to the attorney general and somehow it got lost long and short of it um i found out later that the minister the new minister I was not the interim chair at the time, and the interim chair who we elected was a political adversary of the then minister. So when it got to her to carry the cabinet for um, the attorney general to review, it stopped there. And it didn't go forward. Um, I'm not sure where the grant is now because I'm no longer in the ministry, but I'm still chairing the, the national youth work and we still want to move forward. So, I mean, not just you, but anybody else. Have you experienced something like that? And how were you able to maneuver it and get beyond mm. <laughs> Um, Not necessarily with the um, association. Uh, so, with, so my experience with the Youth Council, I guess, okay. So I think with, with the Youth Council, we've had those kind of, in, issues not necessarily like funding because we had our like oh it's a autonomous organization registered and everything and that's part of it we we, we are registered with the um ministry of legal affairs as an ngo so it isn't necessarily something that can be controlled by the ministry right so i think so if it is funding as it comes in it comes directly to us and not through the ministry because i i couldn't even imagine because of the bureaucratic the bureaucracy and the red tape and it's sit on somebody's desk. And, um, so in order to kind of avoid that, that is one thing to be registered separately. Um, in terms of the, I guess, the antagonistic relationship we can tend to have, um, we try to, I guess, establish our own resources, whether it's through grant funding or whatever, that comes directly to us in order to kind of bypass that. Yes, it's nice to have the ministry a part of it, and if it is, and that's the thing, there is that thing of individuals versus a system, because when the system is broken, you may have individuals that may favor you, but if there's another individual that doesn't, that inherently is the problem, right? So we have to push for there to be like proper processes and policies in place of how we handle things regardless of who is there, you know? And I think that is, I guess, the crux of it. Let me ask you, let me ask you another question regarding the national income. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm now the country manager for USA. Mm -hmm. and implementing a youth program that we do, or we plan to give commitment to um, the establishment of a national youth council and the review of the national youth policy. Have you found, I mean, I know it's small societies and most of the people that form national youth council, national youth organization, are persons who come from the political, like myself, right? I joined the national youth political party group I'm at 16. And I came through that whole process. So a lot of us are like that. Have you found that there's a lot of, of members or people that you try recruiting for stuff have a deep political leaning that affects the operations of the NYC? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Long and short, yes. I think, and I think just I was thinking about that issue because it is um my friends are crying. Um, um, I was thinking about that issue, and um, I think it, there needs to be a policy at the institution about who is in leadership. And I think that we need to say you cannot be politically exposed and a part of the the council, not a part of the council, but a part of the leadership. Right, you can be part of the 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 organ. You can be a part of the organization. You can be a part of whatever political party, and because we can all be a member of a party, but you can't be the face of the party. 
I think it's not in the face of it. It's so think, interesting thing because in small societies, because yeah. when you have very small societies, sometimes the division isn't so easy. That was one of the questions yeah. I was going to ask you. And there's the, the, the side you're talking about where there's potential for politicization, partisan politicization. But then I also wondered if there was another side, because in small societies, do you find that you have greater access? Because I was intrigued mm. by the the first initiative that sort of kicked this off. Mm -hmm. First initiative was that COVID response to mm -hmm. get those recommendations on the agenda when young mm -hmm. people and youth workers have been excluded. Mm -hmm. Is it because, do you think, it's mm -hmm. because you were in a small society that you had that access to be able to push to actually get those recommendations on the agenda? Would it have been the same if you were just a group in a very large country? Oh, uh, I guess. <laughs> Perhaps, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Because they, they know you when you were, mm -hmm. you know, in, in our societies, when she's the president of the National Youth Council, mm -hmm. she's known by everybody mm -hmm. in the society. So you have a, a credibility yeah. that precedes you. So when, even though this is a new initiative in COVID, yeah. that goes before you. People see uh, Amilcar, they see a Shanice, and so on, they have a, a sense of who you are. Maybe, I'm just wondering mm -hmm. if they're more open to listening. Is Perhaps I think you're able to size? because okay. I think you always have to kind of use your yeah. networks to kind of get things through and people mm -hmm. would get people to the, get mm -hmm. into the right place. Mm -hmm. So I think yes, I think you have to kind of know people if it or you have to find a way to I guess navigate that space mm -hmm. or be even become a loud voice that people could recognize, you know, right. and be able to galvanize young people in a in a type of way. Um, but getting back, I, I, because yeah. it is. You cannot be the face of a political party and then run the, the, the youth council because then you council falls to nothing when you go. I heard That's another view. Somebody scenario. else had a sorry. Was case scenario. Because also we have the issue of funders not funding the youth council because you're politically exposed. Mm. Yeah. Because you are associated with they pull their money. And it becomes even more and more an issue now. You know, I went to open a bank account. They asked me, are you politically exposed? Mm. So it becomes more and more of an issue. Sorry, uh, we have a few questions. No, um, I believe that you guys can push on and get more things done. He's right when he says it's the same in Africa or in Ethiopia. Um, you know, we have the minister, he goes out, another party comes in, the new minister comes in, all the funding goes. So, like you said, you can't be the face, but yet you should be the face. <laughs> That's a, a, a another thing. But what I wanted to find out, um, which you also asked, is uh, about professionalization. Um, I saw that you support that, but how far are you guys? And we think it's going to get done because um, we are starting with that process, right? Yeah. Um, we are in the beginning stages. As I said, we are um, completing our registration with the um, legal affairs, as well as making sure that we get our bank accounts and stuff sorted as well. More the administrative part of setting up. That's where we're at. And the next step would then be to reach out to other youth practitioners, um, youth organizations to get them on board. And yes, it will get done because we decided that else was going to happen. And it's going to, you know what I mean? Because we have the will um, as a group, we have the political will to do it and it will happen. And it's not necessarily something that we need the, gov we need the government say so or approval to accomplish. We would appreciate the- We don't um, need the government. I don't think so. But you want yeah. to know about the broader professionalization agenda, not the association? Yes, the, prof the, the professional okay. work. Okay, within Trinidad and Tobago. Yeah, so I mean, okay, so I mean, in terms of establishing the association. Oh, no, no. Um, but in terms of professionalizing it, um, I guess that's where we then are able to now, once we have an established association, be able to lobby government to see, okay, what the process that we need to put in place to make sure these things are established. Mm -hmm. We have, in essence, their word in terms of the policy, 
right? But then you have to do the advocacy work to get the buy-in and to get that as a part of the budget. You know, that needs to be, a, whether it's a public sector investment program or something like that, that the ministry then decides that they want to um, branch into. But I think there are things that we could do um, without their, their thing. I guess it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. Mm -hmm. If it is we want to see the government approval, like, hey, this is a professional sector, or we as young people are saying, hey, this is a profession that we are given respect to, this is the degree, because there's a degree at the university mm -hmm. um, on it as well. So I think we also need to create that awareness amongst you professionals so that they can understand, hey, this is a profession, and they themselves could also lobby for themselves to be recognized and they work to be recognized as well. So I think it's twofold. Yes, we want that, but it may not come as easily. But if there's pressure, you know, people may too. And also too, I think um, with ministers, um, you also have to align interest. You know, um, the minister here could, <laughs> could, could tell me if I'm wrong, but you have to be able to, um, align interest with the ministry and make sure that the work that you are doing is um beneficial you know there's that collaborative thing you know not as a political thing but as a you know we are getting things done you know can let me know if i'm wrong no but the, the earlier discussion what, what i would say is in some cases it is problematic my my current prime minister, um, Ms. Motley, started the youth development program in 1995 when she became minister of youth. And she was only 28 as well. And we did a national survey and she was surveyed. Government would have changed in 2008. And for 10 years, that government treated youth workers as if, you know, they were nothing because they figured out we were all political because I was an officer then. I started as a youth officer. So in some cases, um, governments change and where there's supposed to be that continuity, it don't always happen. So even though that they could have seen the volume of work that was being done on island, because we have 30 youth officers working in our business, and it was a case where um, I dare say we were probably the leading youth uh, ministry in the region because of the volume of work that we were doing. But they figured that, you know, you were brought in by the other party, so we're not going to really support you in the same way that they did. Mm -hmm. So funds were changed and a whole set of things happened in a different way. Uh, so it, it is a situation where, um, I think governments need to recognize that if you're doing youth work and you're into youth work, that the partisan politics don't factor into that at all. Mm -hmm. Because you're servicing the young people and that is, you know, your priority, number one, mm -hmm. not the political class. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, you got an article. Yeah. Okay. Um, related to that, the association about, have you talked about about um, building up soft power, meaning um, using your numbers, your influence to sort of talk about the collective interest of the youth yeah. and ask, maybe sort of put the leaders to task and say, okay, we are supporting ABCD mm -hmm. um, and you are not. So we're going to look for someone. I guess that is sort of being partisan, but instead of partisan, <laughs> more like supporting the individual, or would you rather it stays? completely outside of that? Um, no, I think that is also important too. I don't think it's partisan. I think it's just advocacy. You know, you have to be, you have to speak out about what it is you're trying to accomplish, you know? So there are different levels. So yes, there is, okay, we are doing our own work as an institution, but also um, being able to lobby government for what we see um, is necessary for young people. Right, and that could take place in different ways. It could be through projects, it could be through partnerships with um, Kiowa, it could be through a myriad of ways. But I think it's important that we continue to 
have our voices heard, um, put it into what we want and be consistent about it. You know, so things like the youth ministers meeting are very important because they, they hear these brand new ideas. You know, even though the young people have been telling them that for ages, but they hear these lovely ideas, you know, and they want to bring it back. So um, I think it's important that we continue to have these um, meetings and institutions and have these conversations because, you know, yes, we need to have that systematic change, but they're still individuals and we have good actors. And I think some people see, and I think, I guess in my mind, some people see young people youth work as a career, as in they come, they come to work, they clock in, they clock out, this is their nine to five. And then there are people that are passionate about young people, they came up in the youth sector, they come up in the youth space, they know all the people, you know? And so you have those two people and you have to find a way to appeal to both of them, you know? So the latter person may understand the issue and is already passionate and doing the work. And, and the other person, you have to find strategies to say, hey, let me lighten your load. Let's work on this. We will handle this, blah, blah, blah. You could get the credits, whatever. Mm -hmm. But we are getting, you know what I mean? So you have to be able to be, as I said, strategic and be able to, I guess, um, work the system in a way, you know? But you have to maintain your integrity as an institution and an individual. Yeah, Gavin. I mean, a small, small, small states have a, uh, I think that what we we'll call the a paradox lens. Uh, so the, the same things that make you special and make you, and make it stand out. So besides being able to talk to your minister, being able to, to be to know your minister, mm -hmm. also is the problem that causes you when you when the minister moves out of the way or something happens, I'm not talking to you ever again, Johnny, because you were talking <laughs> to the minister before. So that paradox lens is also something that in youth work also happens. And I figure being able to have the political capital is something that um, as youth workers, as youth, we have to negotiate. And I figure the same paradox to we'll look at in terms of uh, building consensus and building broader value-based youth work. Mm -hmm. So there are certain values that we get buying from both sides. So whether Gavin is on the side of the, the, the leadership or Johnny is on the side of the, the opposition or whatever it is, whatever changes, there's certain core buy-in things that mm -hmm. we get. And I you know this is stuck in the, the great you know, goodness, or all things being equal. But I think that is one of our places in youth work, our small island youth work, that will face one of our greatest challenge, trying to move beyond our narrow situations towards this, but also recognize that because we're so small, it's hard to move beyond the narrow because I know everybody cousin. In my country, either everybody know me, or they know my cousin or somebody like that. Yeah. Uh, I Jamaica is a little bit bigger than, okay. than Turks and Caicos or Grenada and so on, but we still face that same challenge. Yeah. We still face that even if you don't take a overtly political stance by being critical of the state, there is a viewpoint on it. But mm -hmm. I think when you have leadership by it, like certain people who are academic youth workers, who are um, institutional youth workers, who stand with you and say, okay, regardless of whether you like X person or not, these type of things are good. I think we would get somewhere faster. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, oh, yes, thank you. I would like to share, um, speak to different views that have been shared. Um, Seychelles likes more of that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we face all these political and challenges. So we come from a small island where one party has controlled the government for 43 years. And then suddenly in 2020, there's a new election, the opposition coming to party. So most youth work and youth are being are, were used as a political tool. Mm -hmm. I was part of it as well, mm -hmm. as a political activist. And then out of a sudden, the opposition came into party and the youth work were for main party had to work for the opposition. Mm -hmm. So obviously they were a face for the other party, but they had to learn to accept change. Mm -hmm. So there was a, a, a transformation that you had to adjust, you had to adapt, and the new government had to see the skills and the competence of that new worker instead of who or she voted for. Some were made redundant, of course, didn't believe in that new worker, so they brought in their own staff 
who didn't have the competence or the, the, the heart, and we did it in, in, in youth work, and we still pay for that consequence. But those who let, um, who stayed had to change the song, had to play this. It's a political game. You became a politician, but not like hardcore polit politician, but you have to know where you go, how you play, what you, how, how you, how you, 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 you communicate, all these things you learn on the job. Yeah. Um, just to share, because I myself, what I had to do, because I was a face of the main party, and then because I wanted to go forth, so I changed from local government went to education. So I had to become neutral, because I was the face of scouting in Seychelles, and I didn't want that to affect scouting. It even affect my career, because when I go and train and go for parents, or do my counseling, I'm a psychologist by training, I don't want to associate with any party. And that affected my professional career. So I was in the line of becoming like very hard in the line, but I had to put that aside because I had a heart for youth work and community developments and held to positions, but I want to move, um, develop my community. Mm -hmm. So I ha I, now I'm saying, I don't believe in you, I don't believe in you. I believe I'm neutral now, mm -hmm. but this is the price I have to pay. At first I tried putting different hats, like when I speak with this group, I put this red hat. When I speak, I put the, the, the green hat. It didn't work. It didn't work. And even though you say, you have to declare it at some point, like now I'm betting it so far, I'm speaking for the youth. I'm speaking for the committee. I'm not speaking for the red or the green, but somehow people have their own views. Mm -hmm. So I had to, there's a decision youth workers and practitioners have to make. Be neutral, mm -hmm. like know your boundary. Like you're saying, um, Look who you're talking to. And one strategy that we use that I found that it worked for scouting and it worked for the university. So I I know most of the players now. So I've been in the politics, the church, I've played the field. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I use these contacts for the university now. So I know like most of the members of parliament, I know who were scouts before. I know who have been members of the National Youth Council. So I, I profile them. I profile them and I approach them individually and then collectively. I say, you've been one of us. You did that, you did that. So help me to, to get that budget across. Help me through that. So I use that, their past, their, their interest to my advantage. This is the game, finally. And in, and in the end, my message that it's not you who is the country, it's the youth who are building the leaders of, of tomorrow. And also we found that too about the changes in government, we had new ministers. Yes, the um, agenda changes. So what do we try to do? I don't know if it works everywhere. Record keeping. Whatever emails you send, whatever letters, whatever discussions you had, once you get home, write it down. It's like, on this day, on this time, you said this. And keep them to their word. Okay, you signed this treaty, you signed this convention, you ratify this, you said this at this field of such and such conventions. I'm gonna keep you to your word. So we try to corner them in that way and to make sure that they keep their word and they support and they support whatever you're trying to do luckily it's not easy but it, 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 it does pays pays off we found that it helps with the university for example what we're doing we're trying to put them on the advisory board so you give them you know politicians they they want like pump them up so put them on the committees like you like like to be on the advisory <laughs> <laughs> so we do that because they get mileage, they are visible, but it's a win win approach. It's like it's not taking advantage for me, it's like you're doing this not for your party, but for the nation. Yeah. And so come on, my committee minister or, or MNA, and I will help you. But I believe in your principle, but it's for the youth. Yeah. yeah but uh, but it, it, it's hard. It is like everybody knows everybody else. Like it's Seychelles, like. We're like, oh, but you she's in sister, she's in the neck when you come into it. But now they, they know what I'm on about. So they associate me with the university and the, city, the scouts, not with red and blue and, and green, because yeah. for me now it's, it's, it's the youth, it's the, it's the community. So I think you have to change, choose your sites, know your boundary, know your allies, profile your allies, and know how to communicate. Um, keep records of everything that you do, everything that they say, or, or emails or visits, and then give them that visibility. When you have an award, invite them. When you have, um, get them on the stage to say something, to have the keynote, to have, and it, and it is important. They become 
um, the side host of your of your of your program. Some of them will say, no, 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 I don't want to associate with you in case somebody have a misunderstanding of our alliance. But many of them will will support. I, I now have like one quarter of the MAs from the opposition party speaking for scouting now because I've invited them uh, and I profile them because I've learned that they are past scouts and they sponsor different scout troops. So it takes a while. Um, and the other part who knew me is like, you were on our side, what are you doing now? So <laughs> I'm paying the cost, but for me, I don't care because I for the youth. Yeah. yeah. And I think it's, too, part of the issue that happens when you're politically aligned is that not just you are, I guess, blackballed by that party, mm -hmm. There are young people who wouldn't work with people. So if the new party comes in, or even if someone in their own party, and there is some sort of divide or some sort of agenda afoot, the institution and pays for it because you're not working with X person because they doesn't they don't agree with that person that you are aligned with. And I think you as a young person need to have your own integrity about what it is you're doing because you have to decide if it is the work that you're doing. Um, Makes sense because if it is you are political, then the, it doesn't benefit the organization. So you need to then know when to step down as a young person, but also know that, in regardless of whatever your political affiliations is, the agenda of the council is number one. And if you're not able to do that, then you you have no benefit. I think. Can I squeeze in? Oh no, sorry, I see a question. I wanted to squeeze, I see two more, we'll take those, and I wanted to squeeze in one too, if I can. But let's see how we go, I'll give you preference. Yeah, I was just going to add, um, I don't think controversial, nonetheless, I'm not politically aligned in any way, but I, I have seen young persons who are politically aligned still create impact because mm -hmm. they have very strong leadership ability. And one of the things that I think a lot of young leaders are lacking is how to use diplomacy in navigating spaces. And I think I've seen where leaders who are trained in diplomacy know how to, as I say, play the game where they're able to still get things done with the government or the party that they may be aligned to while separating the mandate of the youth council or which of the youth organization they may be. So I, I just say, say that to say that having strong diplomatic skills also helps a lot in terms of navigating space, whether you're politically aligned or not. Because I do think being politically aligned as well is not so bad as well. Because um, if you do look at it in, in all honesty, also parties do have power to make a change. And whether or not you want to accept this, the reality is that political parties will favor their own and they will favor the opposition. And just having a very blunt, honest conversation about that. And it's because there's parties that it's just the nature of politics in some ways. And I, and I say that to say that, not to say that, oh, you need to be political and not, but I'm just saying to you, having diplomatic skills helps a lot in navigating those spaces, but are not your political line. Okay. Yeah. I, do, yeah. I do agree. Like, I do agree that if, if there are young people that are able to navigate that space, I don't think all of them are. Yeah. And I think that um, we have to look at things Yes, there are individuals, but there's also systems. And I think that systematically, we have to have a way of dealing with the politics and having an organization that is meant, that was designed to be apolitical, mm -hmm. right? So I think you as a person need to decide wh where do you stand? If it is your political, we could be political. You know what I mean? But I think it paints the organization. And I think that what good you're able to do now what then happens five, 10 years down the road with the organization? Mm -hmm. uh, is that sustainable? You know, as you said, the, the, poly, the party favors um, their own, but when it's, you fall out of favor, and then sometimes too, it's not their own. Yeah, and also too, sometimes they already have you in their pocket, so they're not even okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so it's there are a lot of dynamics. Important. Yeah. You know, to navigate political spaces, I'm telling you, you can get several yeah, but so, again, the skill sets sometimes are lacking for leaders. True. Hi, um, uh, I'm Valerie. I work with the National Youth Council in Ireland, so I'm really interested in in your work around the National Youth Council and you know how close you are to actually bringing the Trinidad Youth Council and Tobago Youth Council together. 
um, as one National Youth Council. And then I suppose just around the political side of things, I mean, it, within our, the membership of our Youth Council, we would have the youth political parties. But we also then have the uniform organisations um, and we have other different youth organisations. And I just wonder what's the makeup of the membership of the youth councils that, that you have? Do you have those kind of different member organisations or is it kind of more individuals? And then just the connection between um, the, the Association of Youth Development Professionals and the current youth councils as they're structured, is there a connection there as well? Okay, um, so one, in terms of the structure, um, so the current structure is, so there's like a central executive and then we divide the country into districts. It's similar to like electoral districts, I guess, but that's just, I guess, an ease of dividing the country. Um, um, so those districts then are made up of like different groups. So there's a, either youth led or youth serving organizations then um, drive further up into those district youth councils. And so political um, youth arms and all things can be a member of the organization and all of that. So those, that is possible. Um, in terms mm -hmm. of the NYC, the National Youth Council, um, so they're currently in the process of um, establishing it. Um, so, well, I spoke with the team, Dr. Charles' team, and they basically are doing like interviews and doing, so they're basically asking, okay, what does that look like? So I don't think there's like a formal process set up in terms of how it's going to go and how it's going to, mm. what the end product is going to look like, um, because there are also these two organizations, but not they aren't necessarily very strong, at least right now. So there is that need for their own development and seeing, okay, how do then they fit into that um, context of the NYC? That hasn't necessarily been decided or established. You know, and I think that has been partly challenged of getting it set up in the first place. Um, in terms of the alignment of it with those, um, the association, um, so, they would be, you know, partners in terms of um, your development and your professionalization because, you know, those are the people who are actually doing the work and they would also um, be part of the membership as well, those individuals and even the organization itself. So that's kind of like how it's connected. I don't need to ask my question. You asked mine the distinction between Trinidad and Tobago and the difference. So that's great. This yeah. was enriching, Shanice. Thank you so much for sharing your experience. We really appreciate that. And we wish you continued success with the association. And we look forward to hearing about all that you accomplished for young people in Trinidad and Tobago and the wider Caribbean. And thank you all for sharing your experiences and perspectives. I hope you'll continue the discussion, share tips and tricks and well I don't know if you should share any tricks but <laughs> share tips and experiences and um, thank you so much oh my gosh I brought snacks from to Trinidad like those snacks but I don't have it now but find me I'll bring it oh, okay <laughs> I'll bring it it's fine <laughs> thank you thank you everyone